Greetings in the name of our Lord Jesus to all who've been able to tune in to participate in the Columbia Bible College graduation program for 2020. Even though we cannot join together in a large auditorium, we want to joyfully celebrate with our 2020 Columbia graduates. To our graduates, we, your parents, family, friends, alumni, Columbia board members, faculty and staff, we all want you to know that we love you and we are very proud of you. As president of Columbia Bible College, it's a great privilege to provide a brief introduction to our graduation program for this year. As I'm sure you're all aware, this year's graduation is like none other in the 84 year history of Columbia. In many ways, all of us have had our lives and plans disrupted by the COVID-19 pandemic. We're disappointed that we couldn't gather together wear those wonderful gowns, don the, those kind of cool mortarboard hats and flick those golden tassels from left to right. We're very sorry about that, but I can promise you that the following program elements will all have special meaning for today and for the future. You'll hear a brief keynote address from Professor Ken Esau, an original musical piece from your fellow graduate, Wes Braun, the valedictory address from Jessica Stefik, and a concluding benediction from our student dean, Stan Banman. Each one of these presenters has poured their heart and soul into their presentations, and I, will, and I hope that you will sense their deep love for God and for you. I will conclude my comments with a few verses from 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. These words from scripture will also serve as an opening prayer. For now, we really live since you, our graduates, are standing firm in the Lord. And how can we thank God enough for you in return for all the joy that we have in the presence of God because of you? So now, may the Lord make your love increase and overflow for each other and for everyone else. For just, just as ours does for you. And may he strengthen your hearts so that you will be blameless and holy in the presence of our God and Father when our Lord Jesus returns with all of his holy ones. Amen. I want to begin by congratulating the graduates. This wonderful group that I see sitting out there six feet away from your family and friends. You look really good. Some of you I hardly recognize all dressed up. You've overcome many obstacles. You've overcome financial challenges just to be students for one, two, or four plus years. You've overcome learning challenges that some of you face. You've overcome external, family, relational, or other unexpected personal events that have made your journey difficult. You've overcome massive disruptions over the last few months. And you have overcome the huge academic challenges that I and other Columbia faculty, out of our deep love for you, have caused with exams and papers. Do I hear an amen? So today is a day of congratulations. I also want to thank everyone else who played a role in this day. Obviously, to our great God, who is creator, sustainer, and king in Jesus, for whose glory Columbia Bible College exists, but also to all the family and friends who stood with you and, you, and have, pledged, have played huge roles in your success today. I also want to thank the Columbia faculty and staff community, whom I'm imagining today as proud parents, beaming, knowing they were a small part of this day, as well as all the Columbia board members and all the churches and donors who support Columbia so we can live out our mission. So today is also a day to say thank you. While I was planning this presentation, I was hoping for something that would be memorable. People would talk about it, hopefully positively, for a long time. I was thinking hard about what I could do that would be memorable. I heard about Robert Smith, who at Morehouse College last April announced that he was going to pay off the student loans for the entire graduating community of 400. Can you imagine? I thought that'd be great if I could announce that I'd pay off all of your student loans. Is there some cheering out there? Then I talked to my wife and she reminded me that I work for a charitable organization and that Robert Smith is a billionaire. That was quite a downer. 
I also noticed that some of you BA grads have student loans about the same size as the cost of a house in Saskatchewan. So I'm sorry, but the memorable idea is off the table. After that little detour in my thought process, I thought maybe I could give you some hugely memorable and always applicable advice. I was at a graduation ceremony once where someone channeled Winston Churchill when Churchill said, never, never, never give up. I still remember this, and it's helped me in some areas, but it's only partly true. There are times when never giving up is actually really bad advice. I started playing trumpet when I came to Columbia. I even joined the Columbia Jazz Band called the Quasi Modes. I was getting a little better, and I would offer to play trumpet when people came over to the house. And I noticed that they would politely excuse themselves and go home shortly after. Pretty soon, when people visiting would stay longer than we hoped, I would offer to play trumpet, and it pretty much cleared the house. So there are times when you should give up, for everyone's benefit. I gave up trumpet. When people at graduation ceremonies say you can be anything you want if you just work hard enough and don't give up, they are not telling you the truth. Sometimes you give something a great effort, and then with some community discernment, you need to give it up. Sometimes give up is also great advice. So I came to realize that hugely memorable and always applicable advice is really hard to come by. So I took that off the table as well. Finally, I decided that I should stick with sharing words from King Jesus. And Matthew 6.33 came to mind. Seek first God's kingdom and his righteousness. As you graduate, seek first God's kingdom. As you discern your next steps for the summer, seek first God's kingdom. As you discern your vocational or further educational plans, seek first God's kingdom. As you discern where you'll live next, seek first God's kingdom. As you discern your community to walk with, seek first God's kingdom. Since I teach Old Testament, I thought I should include an Old Testament analogy for three ways you can seek first God's kingdom as you graduate. I have with me today a shofar or a yovel, a kind of ram's horn. It was one type of trumpet in the Bible. It's the only trumpet that I've decided to keep with me. It had multiple purposes, and I'm going to suggest that these purposes can help us better understand what it means to seek first God's kingdom. So I'm going to blow the shofar three times to illustrate the three purposes. The first purpose of the shofar was to gather God's people together. We see this in Leviticus 23, 24, to bring the people together for Sabbath events. Seeking first God's kingdom means responding to the shofar blast and each of you finding a shalom Jesus-centered community and joining it, participating in it, serving Jesus in it, praying for it and supporting it. Serving for, seeking first God's kingdom begins by joining Jesus' kingdom people who meet regularly, worshiping King Jesus, living out his kingdom ethics, and pursuing his kingdom mission. God's kingdom is a team sport, not a solo sport. God's kingdom is a participation sport, not a spectator sport. God designed you to be part of the kingdom team. The team dispels fear. The team instills hope. The team builds courage. Now more than ever, we need to be part of Jesus' kingdom community team. While you will, in will inevitably miss this Columbia community, bring what you have learned from here about vulnerability and caring and forgiveness and compassion and offer it as a gift to the new community and be open to all that Jesus can teach you in your new community. Seeking first God's kingdom then means joining God's kingdom community wherever you end up. Don't go somewhere and say, I'll find a shalom community sometime when I have more time. Or I'm only here for a year, so it's not a priority. Don't just visit, join. Don't just criticize, bless. Don't just wait and see, serve. Seeking first God's kingdom means joining Jesus' kingdom people. Seek first God's kingdom. Can you hear the shofar blast? Will you respond and gather with the shalom people of God? The second purpose for the shofar blast was to announce the attack on the enemy. 
The priests blew the shofar before the walls fell down at Jericho. Gideon had 300 men blow shofars before the attack on the Midianites. Seeking first God's kingdom means being part of God's kingdom mission, disarming the powers of death and idolatry. When John the Baptist sent his disciples to Jesus to find out if Jesus indeed was the one bringing the kingdom, Jesus' response in Matthew 11 was, The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is proclaimed to the poor. God's kingdom mission is one of living out the justice and love of God in our broken world and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, inviting everyone from every nation to bow down in front of King Jesus and become kingdom citizens. We have been told over the last month that every small action matters in the war against the COVID-19 virus. Washing your hands properly matters. Coughing in your sleeve matters. Disinfecting surfaces matters. Staying home matters. Social or physical distancing matters. Not touching your face matters. Not hoarding matters. The war against COVID-19 will only be won if we all do a bunch of little things well. We can learn something from this in terms of the kingdom. The Bible in Ephesians 6, 12 does portray the Christian life as a type of spiritual battle against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. In this battle, every act of worship, every act of compassion and justice done in the name of Jesus, every day faithfully completing one's kingdom calling in the workplace or at home is an attack on the, this enemy. This enemy who pretends to represent happiness and fulfillment, but really embodies death and destruction. Every act of reconciliation and healing in Jesus' name is an attack on this enemy. Every prayer, spontaneous prayer, or breath prayer, or Lord's prayer, lifted up by means of the Holy Spirit is an attack on this enemy. Every de declaration of Jesus as king in word or song is an attack on this enemy. Every action of care for God's beautiful creation, done out of worship of the Creator, is an attack on this enemy. Every artistic action that reflects the creativity of God is an attack on this enemy. Every expression of hope over fear, of kindness over hate, of trust over distrust, is an attack on this enemy. Whatever occupation you are going into, your real vocation is to live out the kingdom every day in everything. And that kingdom vocation is an attack on the powers of this present age. The shofar blast then should remind us that the seeking first God's kingdom means that living out king, our kingdom calling each and every day, as represented in all of our choices, is an attack on the death and destruction that have ultimately been defeated by Jesus in his life, death, and resurrection. And these will be fully defeated when Jesus returns. Seek first God's kingdom. Can you hear the shofar blast? Will you respond and live faithfully into your kingdom calling? The third purpose of the shofar blast was to announce a celebration. On Rosh Hashanah, the Jewish New Year, the shofar was blasted a hundred times that day. Can you imagine? It announced celebration. The year of Jubilee, where debts were forgiven, slaves were freed, land was returned to the original owners. This incredible year was to be announced by the blast on the ram's horn. The very word jubilee comes from another word for ram's horn, yovel, and became a synonym for celebration. Seeking first God's kingdom means to lift up our voices and celebrate that Jesus is king and he has brought and is bringing the year of jubilee. The sound of the shofar calls us to celebration, feasting, laughter, joy, freedom, dancing, and renewal. Celebration does not pretend that there's nothing to grieve about. We need to grieve right now for our world. We need to grieve the suffering and loss. 
But we also need to celebrate all that is beautiful and hopeful and sacrificial. Celebration is not turning a blind eye to suffering and brokenness, but is committing ourselves to the hope of the fullness of the kingdom that is still to come. Every evening at 7 p.m., almost all of my neighbors in our neighborhood, we emerge to the end of our driveways. We walk to the end of the driveway and we stand together holding pots and pans and anything else that makes a joyful noise. And precisely at 7 o'clock, we start beating the pots and we start cheering and clapping. And we are doing this because at 7 o'clock, the medical workers change shifts. They're coming off 12 hours of serving people in need, often risking their own health and well-being in the process. These workers may be exhausted and grieving for those they have cared for that day, but we are celebrating love and life in the midst of sickness and death. Jesus, the healer, will bring life out of death. Jesus, the healer, is bringing resurrection. This graduation event is about celebration of God's sustaining grace in your time at Columbia, of you and your diligent efforts, of your community who walked with you in the ups and downs, of the hope that we believe in for the future, your future, and of the kingdom mission you will participate in. While there are stories each of you carry of loss and grief, today we're here to celebrate that God has carried you through to this day. And so we want to celebrate with you. We want to laugh with you. We want to dance with you from a safe distance. We want to feast with you. We want to praise Jesus with you. We want to hug each of you, again, from a safe distance. Seeking first God's kingdom means we celebrate the new creation that God has brought into our world, is bringing, and will one day bring in its fullness. Seek first God's kingdom. Can you hear the shofar blast? Will you respond and celebrate Jesus' year of Jubilee, this graduation day, and God's future for you and all the other graduates? To conclude, seeking first God's kingdom is more significant than if someone came up today and forgave your student loans. It's more significant than the advice to never give up. Seeking first God's kingdom gathers God's people in worship, community, and mission. Seeking first God's kingdom attacks the powers of darkness and death. Seeking first God's kingdom celebrates the year of Jubilee, this graduation day, and your futures. May King Jesus' words from Matthew 6.33 ring out like the blast of the shofar this day and each and every day of the rest of your lives. May the shalom of Jesus go with you now and forevermore. Amen.
Hi everyone, my name is Wes and I'm part of the graduating class of 2020 this year. I was given the opportunity to share a song that myself and Jaden Plett uh, wrote a couple weeks ago. Jaden is also a former student of CBC from a couple years ago. This song was written in light of the current crisis that we're in with COVID-19 and it was birthed out of Psalm 40. I'm going to read part of that for us today. I waited patiently for the Lord to help me and he turned to me and heard my cry. He lifted me out of the pit of despair out of the mud and the mire. He set my feet on solid ground and steadied me as I walked along. He has given me a new song to sing, a hymn of praise to our God, and many will see what he has done and be amazed. They will put their trust in the Lord. So it was at a worship leader's breakfast a couple weeks ago where we looked at this psalm as a devotional, and one of the leaders was really struck by the fact that all David did was wait on God, and God was the one who responded. God turned to him and heard his prayer. God lifted him out of the pit of despair, out of the mud and the mire. God was the one who set David, uh, David's feet on solid ground. And God was the one who steadied him and gave him a new song to sing to his God. And I think it's in seasons like this that we're currently in where we realize that all we really can do is depend upon, upon God and who he is. So this psalm and this song that we wrote invites us to take the posture of completely being dependent upon God. So the verses talk about waiting for God and waiting for who he is and for him to move. The chorus declares who our God is and in light of who our God is, we have our confidence in him. The bridge is a prayer that Jesus would show us what it means to be his hands and feet, what it looks like to embody him and in this season of life. And it's a prayer asking that we would be filled with the Holy Spirit so that the world can see who our God is. So it's my hope and my prayer that you would meet with and encounter God through this song and uh, be encouraged by it. So all praise and glory to God. Thank you for listening.
Teach us how to be your hands and feet. Show us how to embody you. And teach us how, and show us how. Good afternoon, my name is Jessica Stefik, and I'm honored to be this year's valedictorian. It will probably come as no surprise to you that as I was preparing to give this address, what I would say and how I would say it, I had a difficult time, to say the least. In many ways, this year didn't end in the way that I had anticipated or even assumed. 
This has left me to sit with many what ifs and what will be's, finding myself caught between both excitement and lament, a sacred tension. As I have wrestled in these spaces, reflecting on my time at Columbia Bible College and processing graduation in light of our current global context, I found myself taking three postures. It is these three postures that I would like to share with the graduating class today in hopes that they might serve as both a reminder and an encouragement that God is with us, even in a time such as this. The first of these postures is remembrance. Remembrance we see pops up all over scripture. It initiates everything from Israel's entrance into the promised land to the communion table. Memory marks the journey of God's people. And so, as we, CBC's class of 2020, mark the closing of this particular part of our journey and welcome what is for many a season of the unfamiliar, the new, the exciting, and the unknown, I think it is most fitting to begin with remembrance. I remember first year, counting all of the times Ken Esau said Shalom in his Old Testament survey class. It was probably in the hundreds. Little did I know how much this one word would drastically shape my theology. I remember watching the clock as Jesse Nichol went over time in New Testament survey, eager to communicate his excitement for our sacred text while I was eager to get to lunch. How I wish I could have a couple more minutes in that class now. I remember meeting people from all over the world, people with different backgrounds and stories as to how they got to CBC, people who would become dear friends, and people I would walk through questions, challenges, tears, laughter, loss, and triumph with. Second year, I remember Stacy Gleddy Smith and the way she brought worship into every lecture, how I hope to move forward with this disposition. I remember intro to leadership with Jeremy Walker and Kathleen Dahl, cringing every time the classroom tables were arranged into groups, knowing we were either building implausible structures or solving impossible puzzles. How I wish I could gather in those teams now. I remember this was the year that the song Corn Maze by Cody Jackson made its debut and changed the hearts of CBC students forever. Third year. I remember Jerry Paul's in Old Testament theology leaving me with more questions than I went in with, but it was here that I learned how to welcome questions of faith. I remember knowing that I shouldn't leave Michael Zook's New Testament theology textbook assignment to the last minute, but proceeding to do so anyways, if only I could take a class with him again. I remember late nights at Denny's, some of my best papers written over a stack of pancakes and a cup of coffee. Fourth year, I remember Gareth Brandt's spiritual formation and discernment class instilling in me a longing for the next season of life and excitement for the future. And yet, as I sat down to write this address, I couldn't help but long to go back. I remember finding out that I would finish my undergrad from a distance away from the people that I so desperately wanted to savor every moment with. So as I consider graduation today, I cannot help but feel a sense of incompleteness. Like there are hugs I have not given, goodbyes I have not exchanged, and thank you cards I haven't yet sent. But as we remember the milestones, memories, and people that saw us through our time at CBC, perhaps we are also reminded that it was God who brought us here. It was God who kept us here, God who sustained us while we were here, and God who is with us as we go out from here. Like we see in scripture, not only does remembrance remind us of what has been, but it reminds us of whose story we are a part of, whose image we bear, and whose faithfulness we can trust moving forward. If anything, remembrance assures us that before we are anything else, we are God's beloved children. So in light of remembering, I found myself moving into a second posture, which is gratitude. An unexpected gratitude Gratitude not built on flippant hope or unthoughtful optimism, not gratitude at the expense of rightful lament, but a gratitude rooted in the assurance that God is in fact with us and that God's plans for each one of us is good. Gratitude that despite all the places I could have gone, God brought me here. As Ken Esau says, God has a plan for your life, amen? 
Henry Nouwen speaks to gratitude well. He says, in the past, I've always thought of gratitude as a spontaneous response to the awareness of gifts received. But now I realize that gratitude can also be lived as a discipline. The discipline of gratitude is then the explicit effort to acknowledge that all we are and have is given to us as a gift of love, a gift to be celebrated with joy. Now and goes on to say that gratitude, while at times an explicit effort, becomes a possible choice when we return home and hear God say to us, you are with me and all I have is yours. Because before anything else, we are God's beloved children. For this, I am grateful. And as God's beloved, I have many hopes for us as the Columbia Bible College class of 2020, which is why I moved from my second posture of gratitude to my third and final hope. I hope that we will do great things for the kingdom. I hope that we step into and embrace the way of Jesus more than ever before. I hope that we will continue to lift each other up in times of joy and that we will cry with each other in times of mourning. I hope that we will find ourselves in positions and environments so outside of our comfort zones that we have no choice but to depend on God. I hope that we will pursue both theology and praxis built on love for our neighbor, embracing the other, advocacy for the marginalized, peace with our enemies, and justice for the oppressed. I hope for these things with all sincerity and excitement, but have no doubt that they will be, because I know whose story we are a part of. So having moved to the postures of remembrance and gratitude and hope, we might begin to look forward to the future with assurance. But my final exhortation to you, CBC's grad class of 2020, is that amongst the remembrance, the gratitude, and the hope, we would find rest. We've completed our assignments, we have built lifelong friendships, we have questioned, we have grown, and now it is time to rest. We rest in the reality that despite all the great work we've done, and all that we will do, we are God's beloved. We rest in the reality that while we might not have a clue what comes next, we are a part of God's story. And like this story shows, time and time again, God is faithful, even in a time such as this. Thank you.
So we've come to the end of this virtual grad, and I'm very grateful to be able to conclude by saying a few words of encouragement to you on this day. Uh, this occasion also happens to be my last grad after 14 years at Columbia, and it's very hard not to see you in person, but know that each of you are loved, and as a student development department, we are grateful to have journeyed with you and excited for what God might have in store for you in these coming days and years. Uh, we'd like to leave you with two benedictions, uh, one from Ephesians chapter 3 and the other from Numbers chapter 6. Ephesians 3 says, Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. And finally, number six says, The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace.